Uh, without further ado, as you can see, our awesome chef here on the screen, this is Chef Cody. Uh, he has served a number of domestic international diplomats, including senators, governors, uh, former presidents. Also had the opportunity to prepare meals for some famous athletes, such as Tom Brady, uh, Heinz Ward, quite a few people here. So um, he is actually a certified executive pastry chef to the American Culinary Foundation. He's also um, been executive pastry chef at the uh, Pelican Golf Club in Boca Raton. So he's got an awesome recipe for us here today uh, for what better than uh, kick off October here with pumpkin bread. So without further ado, chef, it is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Glad to be here with everybody. Love this recipe here. Really one that um, really touches me because it's one I created and it's actually fitting. If anybody watches Chef Kurt's ultimate dish, he had the guest who I created this for Chef Edward Leonard, certified master pastry or excuse me, certified master chef. Um, so this was created for him. He is a pumpkin fanatic and it really goes to show what you can do with education, especially here at Augusta Scofie. The more you know, the more knowledge, the more power you have with your recipe there. So um, he wasn't satisfied with what they had at the time. So finally said, let me take a crack at it. Did a couple conversions, looked at a couple numbers, and we came up with this recipe. And that got it right where he wanted it. So really goes to show what you can do once you know ingredient function, how everything plays together. So really great recipe here for what we got here. So Got two parts with this one. We'll start with the first part, the streusel, or if I pronounce it streusel, uh, same word. I learned it from a German chef, so he always says streusel. So comes out the German word. So if you hear that, uh, same thing. So I'm going to start with that first thing. All it means is just strew or just sprinkle, which is what you do with it. And it's nothing more than a crumb top. Really easy recipe. So let me share my screen. I'm going to switch over and we'll talk about just how easy this one is to come together. Let me share screens and we'll get started on that. So really easy, really simple ingredients. Got some all-purpose flour, sugar, and then cold cubed butter here. So temperature is super important in pastry, whether you're making our streusel, if you're doing a quick bread, which we'll make here a little bit, a regular yeast raised dough, biscuits. Pinterest is really important. So I've got some nice cold butter here. Um, and really, this is super, super simple. Everything's just going to go right into my mixer bowl here. So flour goes in, sugar goes in, and I'll get a little assistance with a spatula, and then bring our cold butter in here. So really, really simple. And this is unsalted butter. In pastry, we really love unsalted butter. We can control the amount of salt as one, you get a much cleaner flavor. So this one gets simple treatment, what we call the paddle attachment here. So you might've seen a recipe call for a paddle or beater attachment. This is what we're using here today. So I'm gonna add this to the mixer and we're just gonna let it go on a low speed. And we're just gonna get a nice sandy texture on that there. So I wanna talk about what's happening in the mixer uh, here. Show it maybe here as it's progressing along, but again, streusel is just a crumb topping, kind of fancy what we call like a five dollar word there. German, French names, man, fancy, right? So it's not nothing more than a crumb topping, but we're just kind of breaking down our butter. We're going to incorporate it. We're going to get it like a kind of coarse cornmeal, sandy consistency is what we're looking for. So in the industry, I always tell people keep an eye on your streusel because it can go from looking like sand to being a dough like that. So I'll keep an eye on this here as our recipe uh, for our pumpkin bread is coming along there. Um, and we'll kind of show what we're looking like, but just a nice sandy consistency. Kind of tell a story about when I was in school. Uh, again, learned to make streusel from a German master pastry chef. I know a lot of certifications and title in the culinary world. Um, and he was very particular about uh, streusel. If it was even a little bit coarse, you think about kind of the size of a bean. If it was like that, I remember he took the bowl and he goes, this isn't streusel, this is short dough. Bloop, whole bowl right in the garbage there because for him, streusel was really fine, powdery consistency. So that's how I make mine there. So it's really funny to hear different stories of how things came to be, um, but he's German, so I'll take him on how to make that one there. So again, just nice low speed. I'm gonna break it down until it gets that sandy consistency. And we'll show that here in a little bit. 
But in the meantime, let me go ahead and get everything together for our recipe, our main debut here. So we've got a sheet pan of ingredients back here. This is what we refer to as mise en place, which again, fancy French name, which just means everything in its place. And that's just all of our scaling work. So I've got everything ready to go for us here. Really nice laid out, organized, and really important, especially if you're baking at home um, and you don't know exactly how much of everything you have, you wanna weigh it out because volume, sometimes that can really vary. So if I scale it out one day and I scaled my flour out another day, we really get a variance of how much flour. So in pastry, we love weight. Grams is really nice and accurate there. So that's how I've got everything scaled out for me here as well. So method here for our pumpkin quick bread is going to be what we call the muffin method. Um, as you can think, commonly used for muffins. So really simple. We're gonna combine our wet ingredients, dry ingredients, and that is as simple as it gets there. So uh, some people will refer to this as the wet and dry method because it's wet ingredients, dry ingredients there. So first things first with our method here, we're going to sift our dry ingredients. And what I've got here, nice fine mesh sift, really indispensable in the pastry kitchen here. We use it for sifting, we use it for straining things, um, really something that's worth a couple of bucks there. And especially in things like cakes, quick breads, where you're making a pound cake, you're making biscuits, um, really, really vital here. Not only does it combine those ingredients, you're getting a lot of air incorporation. And you'll see as I sift everything together, we're really gonna get a lot of volume just by this. So um, really worth the investment. Sifting really can't be replaced. Some people kind of whisk it together there, but again, you're really gonna see a lot of air incorporation with our dry ingredients. And that's what we're looking for with that. So let me again, change cameras here and we'll walk through this recipe. And we'll take another look at that stroistel here in a little bit as well. So again, we've got my sift here. But before I go into that, let me just go and show you kind of what's working with our stroisel. And again, nothing more than that crumb topping you see on muffins. So you can see it's coming together pretty well. Butter is getting nicely incorporated here. Kind of got some chunks of butter that are still a little bit fat, but it's very, very close. This is what I call the watch out zone for stroisel. Because if you don't watch out, it's going to be that short dough that might shift through in the garbage and culinary school. So I'm gonna keep a close eye on this. Again, low speed's really great. That way it doesn't go too, too crazy here with that. So that's really close. So we'll just sift our dry ingredients. We've got some all-purpose flour here. We've got our leavening, our baking powder, baking soda. Want to get all of that in. Pumpkin pie spice here, you can buy it. I like to make it myself. Kind of control what's in it, how strong all those ingredients are. And it's also best for freshness as well. So you get really nice, fresh ingredients. Um, instead of it staying in the counter for like five years, oh uh, yeah, I'd rather make it every two years or so. And it's better there. So I'm just gonna sift this. And you can see this little mound of flour is really gonna plump up as we sift it. So on a piece of parchment, that's how I like to do it. And you'll see why here just in a little bit, why I like to do it on parchment paper. So everything moves in, you can really see how that kind of fluffed up with our flour, really nice and light again, distributed the leavening, distributed that uh, spice mix. So good to go with that one there. And again, love parchment paper. One, because I can just really cleanly get this out of my way and then move on to the next step. Also serves as a kind of spout and we'll see that here in a second. So again, this is what we call the muffin method or what some chefs call the wet and dry. So that was our dry. Now it's time to talk about our wet ingredients here. So first is first eggs, it's really common in pastry there. And again, temperature really, really important in pastry. So all of my ingredients are room temperature here. So I let these sit out for a couple hours here. That way I'm sure they're nice and room temperature. Just really gonna give us a nice volume on our pumpkin bread here. A little bit of oil. And I love oil for baking, really gives it a nice moistness as well as with the shelf life. 
And then the recipe calls for oil, and that's just any kind of neutral oil. So it's going to be vegetable oil, canola oil, corn or peanut oil would be just fine. Just want to avoid strong oils like a olive oil. I want to save that for your salad dressing. So that goes in milk. Give it a nice richness as well as, well as a good color. A little bit of salt goes in. And I like to put my salt. This is a kosher salt and just gives it a chance to dissolve. Um, because we're not going to mix our quick bread very much. So it gives it a head start in the wet ingredients. Vanilla extract goes in. And of course, start of the show, canned pumpkin goes in. And you could definitely do it yourself if you wanted to use fresh pumpkin, boil it, roast it however you'd like to treat it, then just puree it until it's nice and smooth like we have here. Um, but I just like to use what's available in the can. That's what most people have as well. Um, even though this pumpkin kind of side note is more close to a squash than a pumpkin. So that's what they don't tell you on the back of the can. And then of course, some nice brown sugar goes in with that as well. And that's going to give us a nice molasses flavor, a good sweetness, a balance of bitter molasses, sweet sugar. And this is light brown sugar. If you had dark brown sugar, that would work just fine as well. It would just give a little bit more of that robust smoky molasses flavor uh, as well with that. So I'm going to Clear the deck, get all the dishes out of the way. Then we're just gonna whisk it together. Whisk really nice for this. If you wanted to do it in the mixer, you could do that as well. Calls for the paddle attachment. So exactly same as you were doing with the streusel. But here, since my mixer's in use, I'm just gonna use a whisk. And it's just gonna come together really quickly, break up those eggs. We're just gonna look for it to be nice and smooth. You can see beautiful orange pumpkin color. So we're looking nice here. Eggs are broken up. One thing I do wanna say about the eggs, what I like to do, always weigh your eggs there because the large eggs can really vary between uh, your supplier there. So what I would like to do, one egg's about 50 grams, but not always. So this one calls for 170 grams of egg in the recipe. So I know I needed about four eggs. So I'll crack three eggs, scramble the fourth one, and then I'll weigh that out to get exactly 170 grams there. So this is good to go. Really, again, two simple parts, wet, dry, and we'll bring it together. But before I do, let me go and talk about that streusel real quick. Can't forget about that. So it's looking good for me here. Really nice sandy consistency for me here. Butter's really nicely broken down. You can see nice little, little crumbles there. And that's what my chef was really picky about, the little crumbles. If it looked like that, he would have lost his lunch. So that's why we don't want to overmix this. Just nice powdery consistency, kind of like a coarse corn milk. That's streusel there as well. And it's really great as well, especially for our uh, quick breads, whether you're doing it in a loaf pan, whether you're doing it as a muffin, because if you get really big pieces of your streusel, it's going to kind of fall to the bottom of your loaf. And then it's not going to be as pretty, but when it's nice, kind of light powdery, it's going to give it a really nice, delicate, crispy crunch. It's also going to give it a chance to suspend on top. So this is ready to go. That'll be on standby for me there until we need it. So hey Jeff, we, we do have a question here from the chat. Um, sure. We have, uh, Angela is asking, can you use almond flour to replace regular flour? Oh, good question. Yeah, and I get that a lot, especially gluten-free uh, is something that's becoming more and more common both in the home and in the industry as well. So you do want to use some sort of wheat flour or wheat flour replacement, such as Cut for a Cup by Thomas Keller. King Arthur brand has a great gluten-free flour brand. But I would avoid almond flour because that's high in fat, doesn't have the same starch content. So you're not going to get that same uh, outcome that we're looking for there. So I would save the almond flour for things like macaroons as well, but definitely want to use something that's a wheat flour, such as EP flour. Um, any brand works just fine there, um, or a gluten-free replacement there, but almond flour, not quite going to do it for this recipe, but that is a great question there. Any other questions there, John? Uh, looks like just uh, Terry had asked, why didn't you add the salt to the dry ingredients? <laughs> Yeah, so salt, I like to add it to my wet ingredients just because I use a coarse sea salt um, or uh, and it doesn't always dissolve because we're only going to do minimal mixing once we combine our dry with our wet. So if I added it with my uh, dry, sometimes it doesn't quite get dissolved. And I've had uh, 
can't full of salty cookies because people added the salt at the wrong time um, because it did get fully dissolved and you're getting like patches in your product there. And that's what we want to avoid. So I just like to do the safe bet here, throw it with the wet. I know it's going to get dissolved and we'll be good to go there. So um, before I combine the two, um, I'm just going to prepare my pan. So I'm just going to do a loaf pan here. And I always like to talk about so many different options you have. You have the dark ones, you have the light ones here, or what most people have at home, they've got a nice glass one as well. So I'm just going to use this standard loaf pan. This is an eight and a half by four and a half inch loaf pan. But if you have a slightly larger size or smaller size, um, would work. Just want to be careful that you don't overfill if you use anything less than an eight and a half by four inch pan um, there. But this one really nice. It's a light colored one. I'll save my darker one for more breads because this bread has a lot of sugar in it. Um, and it could get a little bit dark if I used my darker aluminum pan here. So if this was all I had, what I always recommend, put a sheet pan underneath and that'll kind of buffer your heat so you don't get as dark of a bottom there. But I've got this one here. So that's what I'm going to use here today. Um, if you like, you can coat it with a little bit of parchment paper to help release. Um, but this one's really good. I've done a good job taking care of it. So it's not very scratched up. So I'm just going to use a little bit of non-stick hand spray just to encourage everything to come out nicely for me there. No need like we... to work so hard if you can't I'm get sorry. it to come out. <laughs> Looks like we do have another question here. Um, Matthew is asking if we can substitute milk like coconut instead of using um, regular dairy milk. Yeah, that's a great question as well. So the good thing about this, you can make it dairy free, not egg free, but dairy free with a, a milk substitute. So oat milk works great for this. Almond milk would work fine as well. Um, cashew milk, any kind of milk replacement um, there. That's a nut milk would be fine. Pea milk works great as well. Um, coconut milk, wouldn't use that one for one reason. Coconut's kind of the outlier in this equation here because coconut is a little bit higher in fat when they turn it into the milk there. So um, I would save that. Another reason coconut milk is kind of a more a robust flavor there. The nut milks other than coconut are a little bit more mild, a little bit more tame. So with this one, um, again, cashew milk, almond milk, oat milk would be just fine. Coconut milk, save that for pina coladas. I know summer's gone, but save it till next year. Um, it'll be good to go. Okie doke. So let me go back and I'll switch cameras. And we'll bring this together and it comes together really, really quickly. And what I do want to point out before we get rocking and rolling with the mixing, because it happens rather quickly, um, you don't want to over mix whether you're mixing in your KitchenAid mixer, if you've got one of hand mixers or doing it by hand, you don't want to over mix because that creates too much what we call gluten, which gives a really kind of chewiness to our product. So while we would want that for like a French bread, for any kind of muffin, quick bread, which is what we have here today, you want it to be really nice and tender. So the more you work it, the tougher it gets, and that's what we want to avoid. So you'll see as I'm mixing it, I'm just going to mix it till the flour and dry ingredients are moistened. Don't want it to be necessarily uh, smooth. I just want everything to be hydrated because, again, the more you work it, the more gluten and the tougher your product. And nobody likes a tough muffin. So just really going to quickly mix this very, very minimal as well. So switch cameras here real quick. And again, everything's nicely combined here. Now what we call homogenous, everything's nicely emulsified. You can't really pick out our pumpkin from our eggs, from our oil, really nicely combined as well. So going back real quick to why I like parchment paper here, you can see really nice, it's contained. And what I'm gonna do, I'm actually gonna pick this up like a little pouch. And that makes it really, really simple to transfer into our wet. Really easy, like that. Parchment's nice and clean. I can reuse this again for another time. So again, mixing method, really, really important. Nice, gentle. And we're just gonna get it to everything's combined. I like to like go in a counterclockwise motion whisking while I'm turning the bowl and that just brings everything together a little bit more quickly there. So again, scrape the bowl and I'm getting pretty close. So this is close. So we do wanna get rid of kind of those little lumps of dry flour 
but we're very, very close. So I'll give it a couple more turns like that. And then what I like to do is just finish with the rubber spatula there. I think the whisk is a little bit more efficient than mixing with your rubber spatula, but sometimes just can't get the sides of the bowl and some dry flour can hide. So I'm just gonna fold. So I'm gonna go down in the middle, fold it over, turn the bowl a quarter turn. Just do like that a couple times to bring everything together here with that. Good thing about the muffin method, again, a little few little dots of thickened product is fine. If it's dry flour, you wanna mix that in, but I can see a little, few little bumps in our batter. And that's just fine for this method here. And that's actually what we want, especially if you th make things like pancakes, you want some little lumps in there. Again, that's gonna ensure you get a really light fluffy product there. So this one is going to go right in my prepared pan here. And this is actually a half batch. So the recipe that you guys have is going to make a full two loaf pans. Or you can do one loaf pan, and then you can make 12 muffins with that particular recipe here. I'm just going to get all the goodies out of my bowl real quick. Try not to hit my camera. Because again, in the culinary industry, Food cost is very important. So we want all of our pumpkin bread going into our loaf pan here. So what I like to do is I'll just give it a little tap, kind of spread everything out there and just to kind of settle things with that as well. So if you wanted to, you could just bake it right like this. It would be just fine. But I like to do a little bit something it kind of takes it up a notch here and it gives it a little bit more of that bakery appearance as well. So I'm actually going to score it or I'm going to cut it a little bit with a what we call a bench scraper. So this is just a metal blade, really great for yeast raised doughs for portioning there. Um, but we do need to give it a little bit of treatment here. So if you have a pan of oil, you can just dip it in a little bit of oil. I like to go about half an inch on the blade there, but because I've already got it here a little bit cleaner, just gonna give it a little bit of my pan release. And both of them are oil, so it works just fine. You can see it's a nice coating. Then I'm just gonna take it about that half inch and go right inside my loaf here. And what that does, it gives it a little bit of a weak spot where that oil is. And in the baking and pastry world, we know that as a tenderizer. So it weakens that little crack you can see right down the middle. So as it bakes, instead of going up evenly, it's gonna have that weak point, that little fault line is gonna kind of open for us there. And it's really gonna give it a really bakery uh, finish as well. So that's a really great tip there. Um, if you want, you can bake it like this, but want a little crunch as well. And this recipe is so versatile. So again, I've got my streusel here and I'm just gonna give it a little coating on the sides here. You can leave it just plain, that would be just fine. But really versatile recipe here. Could do a lot of different things. So I'm actually gonna go pretty heavy with my streusel on top here. And it's really gonna give it a nice layer of crispiness when it bakes. Um, so I'm really not gonna be afraid of adding too much here. You really can't go too much on the streusel. If you go too light, it'll be a little bit of a disintegrated uh, streusel and it won't have that nice appearance there. But then kind of leave an opening for that line to open up a little more easily there. So this is ready to bake, but breads best if you make them, bake them right away. So let me go ahead and put this in the oven. And then we'll show you what it looks like once it finishes. And actually, let me switch cameras real quick, see if we can show that angle real quick. We've got a nice platter here of different pumpkin breads here. So um, again, really versatile recipe here. We've got just the classic pumpkin bread that we have that score line in the middle here. We've got some topped with pumpkin seeds. And if you do that, you want to have unsalted, unroasted, because they're gonna to be toasted in the oven. And we've got some muffins here with a little bit of our streusel um, on top there. So let me change views and talk about the inside, which is kind of the best part with our quick bread here. Um, really, really nice moist recipe, um, lasts a long time here. So even if you make it the day before, I'm still gonna be nice and moist here, but you can see, 
kind of a different look here, depending on what your bake shop wants. Same recipe, a little bit of health benefits. Maybe you mark it with that one. This one's got a nice crispy streusel layer on top as well. And then our classic here, the pumpkin loaf here, really nice moist from fineness here. If you have a lot of big holes, just a sign of a little bit of over mixing. So you know next time to go a little bit lighter um, there, but really nice. This loaf, I like can press it, springs back, showing it's got nice moistness um, smell. Really, it's, it's fall in my hand right here. Really a nice combination of spices. The pumpkin comes through just right. Um, so really, really, this one's uh, one I make year in year again. Great recipe there, and I hope you guys like it as well. What questions can we answer? Somebody asked, oh, right. can you add the crumble before and after baking? Is that what it says, right, John? Yep, that is, that is exactly uh, be, uh, yeah, before or after. Yeah, so I like to add it before baking because you've got the butter and flour, and it's actually raw, and flour you actually can't eat raw. E. coli salmonella likes to hang out there when they uh, mill the flour. So that's why you have to bake things like cookie dough, more of that than the eggs actually we're afraid of there. Um, but you do want to add it before baking. It'll get really nice, light, crispy, airy, and that's really giving a nice contrast between that moist uh, pumpkin bread and a crispy topping. So you do want to add it before you bake it there. Good question. Uh, and Faith is asking, did you use butter or in your mixture or oil? Oh, good question. So for the streusel, I want to use a, a butter because it's a solid fat. It's going to make like little flakes in that flour and give it a nice kind of uh, light, fluffy texture. They're kind of like biscuits. Biscuit, we leave it a little bit larger. Same idea for our streusel here. We want to be really nice, flaky, uh, really fall apart in your mouth. So for that one, I did butter. For the pumpkin bread recipe, I actually used oil itself. Um, some recipes do have butter. Some have combination of butter and oil. Some have ground butter, which is super delicious. Um, and French, we call that bird noisette, which means uh, hazelnut butter or brown butter. Caramelizers, milk solids, really delicious flavor. Um, but the reason I choose to use oil, number one, it's cheap for industry production standards there. And also oil tends to give a more long shelf life here um, because oil is uh, liquid at room temperature. You think about butter, it stays solid. So you get a more moist crumb with that. If you did use butter, which you could substitute it here and it would come out just fine, but it wouldn't stay quite as moist. You'd see as it kind of ages the next day, it's not quite as moist as that first day when you made it, but oil, because it is a uh, liquid at room temperature, kind of it glides past your tongue and that's why it gives that perception of moistness as well so that's why i like to use it in this recipe all right thank you chef and, and we have another it. one asking um for angel uh, for which height are you putting this in the oven angel do you mean like your um what what rack height is what you're looking for oh that's a great question and i love that because um it really varies with ovens here so for this one, you want to try to bake it in the middle of your oven, but all ovens are different. I say all ovens are guilty until proven otherwise. Here, so here's a good point. <laughs> Check the temperature of your oven. Make sure it's accurate there. Some ovens can say maybe it's 350 on there, but it's really only 300. So you know to calibrate and adjust accordingly there. Um, my particular oven, I remember it was a Joy Baking Cookie the first time, really bakes hard on the bottom and barely any at the top. So I know I have to bake my bread a little bit higher in the oven, but most folks, middle of the oven, you're good to go. That's the sweet spot, but know your oven. That's the best tip for pastry right there. Know what your oven does. All right. And then Faith, uh, yes, that's, did, did you preheat your oven before baking? Yes, I do, yeah. Always for me, pre the oven in the industry, your oven's going to be going 24 7 almost, or your whole day shift, maybe not 24 7, but it's always going to be running. And that really helps you get a really nice rise in the oven there. Sometimes, if you start with a cold oven, that leavening your baking powder, baking soda, it doesn't get that good kick in the oven or rise. So, I like to have a nice warm oven, really gives it a good puff and rise with your breads. 
And then uh, Mandy is asking, yes. yeah, convection or, or regular. Oh, so I wish I had convection. I only have a what we call conventional oven. But if you did have a convection feature or the one with the fan, that one would be beautiful, but I do not. So either works if you do a convection oven. So the one with the fan, you might have to pull it a little bit earlier. For me, it's going to take about an hour in my particular oven. Um, if you did a convection, maybe you start checking it about 40 minutes because you usually have a reduced time there. So just uh, see when a recipe is written. Is it a convection oven, conventional oven there? So you can monitor the baking there. All right. Uh, let's see here. It looks like uh, Lauren, you have a question here. Go ahead and put that in the chat there, Lauren. Yeah, I see somebody said it. they bet it smells awesome. And yeah, um, <laughs> I had a bite. I may have had a little bit of a pumpkin muffin before we started, but yeah, just <laughs> the smell of mixing it. Yeah, I'm already hungry again. So it's it's dangerous, <laughs> you know, summer body. Yeah, that's for the summer. It's time for all the sweets in the fall and the winter. So yeah, it, it smells awesome in here. All right. And looks like the last question we have here from Faith is uh, measure your ingredients before mixing, please, according to the grams of the bread. Uh, Faith, just want to make sure you're on, I'm understanding correctly, you mean measure out your ingredients before you get started? Yeah. Yeah, so to answer that question, um, I do always like to measure before I get started here. Just that way I'm making sure I have all my ingredients. Maybe I don't have as much brown sugar as I need. And then that way you have all your mise en place ready and everything really comes together um, as you need it. You don't have to go run to the room and be like, ooh, oh my goodness, about out of oil or, oh no, I'm a little bit short on my brown sugar. You have everything together and that way it's a lot more smooth when you are baking as well you're not stressed out everything just really quickly comes together as well something else which really home baker is super important here um, on your baking powder i always want to put a date on it as well six months and then it's probably time to get a new one there if you don't do a lot of baking um who knows could be in there for two years and you're not going to get the good rise especially with biscuits you don't really get that good flaky biscuit. So date your baking powder after six months, probably need to get a new one and just really takes your baking to the next level as well. Let's see. Uh, Angel's also asking, do you ever need to quote tent your breads while baking? Yeah, that's a great point there. So um, tenting, as we refer to it, is just kind of giving it a little bit of a cover. Um, when we're baking it for anybody's like, what are we talking about camping? I know it is fall season. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I definitely I always keep an eye on it there. You know, ovens have sometimes a mind of their own. So you may bake something time and time again. And I always recommend people stay close to your oven, stay in the kitchen because your nose, N-O-S-E, nose, K-N-O-W-S, your nose, nose, because you can smell something if it's starting to get a little bit over caramelized or starting to get a little bit burnt, you can be like, hmm, something doesn't smell right. And the more you bake, <laughs> your nose and your senses really come together as well. So I'll keep an eye on it. Um, if I need to give it a little bit of tinting, it's usually not until the last 15 or so minutes. So I'll check it at 30 minutes, see how it's going. I'll give it a rotation. So I'll give it 180 turn. Um, and see how it's doing, look at the progression. But um, if you do need to tint it, totally I'm not going to affect the baking. Just don't want a really dark, dark surface. Nice kind of uh, burnt orange color is just fine. Black orange uh, might be a little bit dark, but definitely <laughs> don't be afraid to add that aluminum foil tint. All right. Well, sounds good. Well, thank you very much, Chef, here for your uh, demonstration for us today. Uh, we all enjoyed it and think we're all in the pumpkin mindset now. So uh, that being the case, have a wonderful day, Chef, and thank you very much for joining us here today. Thanks, guys. Enjoy. Bye. Alrighty.